you can study the CT scans of the patients and you can also see their treatment plan. And then you can put them inside an AI model and it will tell you the probability or that this patient will have xerostomia or which patients will get xerostomia and which patients won't. Why certain patients, like immunotherapy doesn't work for certain head and neck cancer patients and why certain patients respond really well for immunotherapy. And that's purely based on pixels. That is absolutely wild. Welcome to Target Cancer Podcast. My name is Dr. Sanjay Janeja. I'm a hematologist and medical oncologist, also known as the Onc Doc on social media. And today I have quite possibly the person, this just hopefully is a testament to how much I care about education because this man will make me uh, obsolete within a couple of months. His animations are just so amazing. Um, he teaches cancer in a very simple way and he's amazing. And, and I'm actually a little uh, fanboying to see him today because he's he's in his 20s. He's just that the 3.0, 7.0 version. So Dr. Musti Kadim is joining us actually from Sweden, and he is a radiation physicist, but just really understands cancer well, you know, across the board. So with all that said, I guess I'm going to, this is the moment because I just, again, your material, everything is so amazing. And this is where we introduce you to the people that will be following you, I think, very enthusiastically. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This is, it feels a bit surreal for me that I'm invited here because you, you and your videos have been quite the inspiration for me to start explaining cancer in an easy way. So me being here just feels a bit surreal. So no thank way. you for the invitation. Yeah. <laughs> is there a video I, in particular that did it for you? Yeah, I remember you had one of your videos where you were explaining cancer uh, using like a pool table, like the billiard table, I would call it in Sweden. And uh, you were talking about the cells and how these balls interact with each other and so on. It was such a nice, easy way video to ex like explaining cancer in such a brief way that even my little sister actually understood it. And it was like so cool for me to like have this kind of idea like, yeah, I mean, even cancer, despite being complex and such a... a a complex topic you can explain it in such an easy way so that was the beginning of my journey you can say oh my gosh i'm <laughs> blushing you can't see it on the camera but i'm <laughs> blushing yeah that was on car t therapy because it's very interesting yeah. if anyone's listening car t therapy is really neat because you take out your lymphocytes which are you know cells that really help you fight um cancers all the time and you basically stick more or less a feature of the cancer you're trying to fight. Usually we do blood cancers right now. And you kind of just say, hey, this is your wanted poster. And then you put those lymphocytes back into the body. And then now it's like this smarter, like, aha, I know what I'm looking for. And so if you have a receptor or a protein that you know is a hallmark for that blood cancer, then it can do a you know a very you know phenomenal job on attacking it. We actually did a, um, a series for Leukemia Lymphoma Society with Dr. Sergio Geralt, Rain Rouse, um, Christopher Flowers uh, in the States last year, uh, kind of wanting to make this available to the community. Because that's another big problem is, is people don't understand that we have some amazing things, but what's hard to appreciate is the actual access to them, right? It's the whole access to care. Even in this country, it's just a matter of just like, they're not being referred, they don't know, they're getting intense chemo for, you know, resistant or quick relapse of very aggressive blood cancers. And, uh, and this is one of those, you know, many things that we try to teach. And that's why I love your content is you're like, one, you know, we were saying earlier, I don't remember if it was in the pre-talk or while we were filming, but, but cancer is very challenging, but I think understanding it or really anything is, can be broken down pretty simply. Like, you know, it's just a matter of, of breaking it down. And then that actually inspires confidence and also tolerance for why chemos may make you sick. If you don't understand what makes the cancer so challenging, and then you just have side effects, it makes the whole experience, which is what I'm told, you know, never pretend to know myself, but, but I'm told that that just makes everything a little different, the lens, because now you're understanding what you're trying to accomplish, why these side effects are happening, happening, et cetera. So if we can start with one, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about what got you into radiotherapy and why, uh, do you practice radiotherapy now? You do it in all tumor types. How how are you practicing in Sweden? Yeah, so in Sweden, I'm uh, working as a medical physicist and half time PhD student. So uh, and I'm working at the radiotherapy department in Lund, which is a city south of Sweden known for its research in cancer. Um, 
Beside that, I'm also doing my PhD with Lund University. So before I got interested in radiotherapy, I was actually aiming to become a doctor. But then at the same time, I also love the, the, the concepts of physics and math. So I wanted to combine this interest somehow. And the closest thing I could find was medical physics. Uh, so I applied to that program and I didn't know that it was it will be used with uh, like to fight cancer. I always thought it will be maybe to develop medicine and so on. But then to my fascination, it was actually used to like treat cancer. Like one, one of the aspects of medical physics, you can use this knowledge to treat cancer. Uh, so I became very interested in radiotherapy and more specifically external radiotherapy. Because in Lund, we also have nuclear medicine and other aspects of uh, radiotherapy. So the Department of External Radiotherapy uh, in Lund, that's what I'm working at Skåne University Hospital, more specifically. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's my love to, for medicine and my love for physics and math. And uh, uh, now we live in the age of AI, so it feels like this is the perfect position in history to actually be in the field of medical physics. 1,000%. You know, I, I've actually never shared this story on any podcast or interview I've done or anything, but I, I, I wish I knew about, believe it or not, like, uh, the potential of being a physicist when I was in university, because I've given a lot of advice when they're like, well, I want to help like be cancer, cure cancer. I'm like, look, if you want to cure cancer or like be a radiation doctor, because those are the ones where you can like very pretty definitively get a good response. And, you know, medical oncology, it's a lot of maybes. Um, but I used to teach physics too, like for the Princeton review, actually. So I love physics. I love science. That's why I went into medicine originally until I lost my eyesight. I was going to be a science teacher. So I can definitely appreciate um, everything you're you're saying and, and you're doing an amazing job at it. It's actually funny too because I wanted to become a physics teacher too. And then okay. I, yeah, yeah. So this is really cool to hear that uh, it's, th it's not that uncommon that people maybe are in these paths and then they change path. <laughs> yes, exactly. And we have the same globe as we mentioned. So, you know, just yeah. <laughs> uh, two old souls meeting, you know, again for the first time. So... One of the videos I really liked, and if you feel comfortable, I'd like to talk about it. It's it's what you had on pancreatic cancer. It is the one oh. that really scares at least Americans for sure. It's the most common question I get. And you went into some beautiful uh, descriptions about why it's so challenging. And, you know, the couple that stuck out, and we've talked about it many times on the podcast, but always touched on it, is that, you know, it has a high recurrence rate. It's hard to catch early. That's probably the number one reason that it's so fatal. It's just you got to catch it. And we've you know, talked about that concept many times on any cancer. But then also that, you know, you had mentioned how it does not care if it can't get blood supply. It doesn't care if, um, you know, about oxygen even. So we actually had Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee talk about kind of starving a pancreatic cancer, right? How do you get the, the cells away? And then we had Ricky from UPenn who talked about how it hijacks a lot of the immune system and kind of uses it as hostages to say, yo, don't attack me because you have a bunch of, you know, innocent um, people here. And then we had Dr. Paul Billings talk about how uh, to catch it early, even if you have a little ductal fullness to use what he's studying, exosomes, to have this kind of signaling between these different cells to appreciate maybe something is arrived before it becomes invasive. Because that's an important concept. The same way that ductal, uh, ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS, stage zero breast cancer, it's breast cancer, but it's not invaded yet. And that can happen in the bladder, obviously. It can happen anywhere, but those are the more common ones. If we are somehow able to appreciate that beforehand, now Dr. S uh, now Scott Penberthy, the director for Google for Applied AI, his concept is, Sanjay, why don't we just wear you know, devices that always are kind of gauging our metabolic rates. And then we can just see, you know, in a longitudinal way, a difference. All of a sudden, if you can identify the things that are released in somewhat of an exosome form, then you're able to catch it. So maybe expand on that and really how, why is radiation also so stubborn when it comes to pancreatic cancer? I know MDA, MD Anderson has been very enthusiastic the last couple of years of believing like, hey, chemo radiation together at the same time, like we do for head and neck and, you know, some rectal, uh, anal cancers, they really want to believe that that is the way to go. But obviously it's, it's not a home run. Do you have some reasons on why that might be the case? Yeah, I think it all comes back to the problem, like the original problem with any cancer, 
it's so different from patient to patient. And I think that's also one of the things that researchers are highlighting today. When you say that there is one pill or one vaccine against cancer, that will never work because cancer is not one disease, it's 200 different diseases at least. And even if you have a twins that have breast cancer, their cancer is so different from each other. So that's one of the biggest challenges we have right now. And that's why uh, we hope maybe with AI and other tools we have today, um, we can we can minimize this gap between what we consider to be an effective treatment and what actually doesn't work due to the variation of biology or like the cancer bi uh, microbiology. So radiation has been very effective treatment because we have so many experiments and research that we, we know that if we increase the amount of radiation, we can destroy the DNA of the cancer cells. But that also doesn't come uh, without any losses. You can also destroy the normal cells. So there is a limit for how high you can go up with radiation. And now we have um, research supports that if you combine chemo with radiation, you can have higher or more effective treatments. But that also doesn't work for certain cancer. And one of them is the pancreas cancer because it's all our treatments today are based on the assumptions we know about biology. But they are all assumptions that we still, we still there's so much we don't know about biology, specifically cancer biology. So when we see certain treatments that we consider super effective, let's say chemotherapy, surgery, and then radiotherapy, and then you use them on all patients, and it's still 50% of these patients die, then you start to like question, is it the treatments or is it that there's something we still don't know about the biology of the cancer? And I think it's actually, it's not the treatments. It's just that we don't know enough about cancer. And I truly believe that with the help of AI, we will minimize this gap and hopefully we'll find the best or optimal individual treatments for every patient because that's the key concept here. We need to adapt our treatments for every patient's biology and not like get a population of patients like, yeah, you know what? They all have the same breast cancer patients. Let's give them the same amount of radiation. And then all of a sudden you see that 10% of them still die. And maybe some of them will still get recurrent where others don't. And you will always have this kind of things that we lack understanding, but we just keep assuming. Yes. I think one example of that, and I've never used this example, and it's it is almost borderline offensively simple, but but it helps with the concept. And that's, you know, the Super Bowl was last night. And if you're watching and, you know, you're like, you know, I want my son to be a quarterback that has three, you know, Super Bowl titles and, and, yeah. and in their 20s or a basketball player. It may seem like you can find out what, you know, Mahomes in this case or whoever did in their training, who they had, who was their coach, who was their, you know, training program, what was the series of training ever since he was six years old or whatever that training may be, you may say, I'm going to put my kid in that because clearly it worked. It worked so well. Like he has three rigs. And obviously, if anyone's listening, you put a hundred kids, a thousand kids, a million kids, they're not going to perform to like, like on that level, even though everything else was the same, the same coach, the same team, the same everything. That kind of even starts to suggest the idiosyncrasies of what matters in the biology, both of the individual and that's what we keep forgetting. It's not just the biology of the cancer now, because they all have different hats, but also what is the metabolic health of that patient? How much insulin have they been subjected to over their X amount of years? Has it been 30 years or has it been 60 years? Do they have a lot of growth factor. You know, what does their immune system look like? How's their gut microbiome? Because we know that the the bacteria and and the distribution in your stomach are very in, intimately related to the health and robustness of your immune system. And we know the immune system has a lot to do with beating cancer. Right. So that same way, you know, yeah, things like height may matter, but also just inherent dexterity. How are you able to you know, execute the task at hand? And I hope that can make someone just start, start to appreciate um, that it's a challenge based on data. And also on the flip side, you know, if one does have cancer to realize no matter how bad the data appears, like you are your own person. And I will yes. say I had a one case, a pancreatic cancer case this year that got referred to me seemingly late. It had been like three or four months at least by the time the referral was put in for a pancreatic mass. And they had very, very obstinate or, or challenging sugars. It was always six to 700. 
And by the time we were able to actually get that under wrap at all, or the, the, the primary team, I'm like, this is just such a bad us. Then we gave the chemotherapy, Fulfirinox, which I was afraid they wouldn't handle well because they were a little older, et cetera. Breeze right. through the chemo, first of all, which is supposed to be a very challenging chemo, like unbelievably. And then secondly, like even, I mean, just disappeared within a couple of cycles. And that's, and I'm like, now I'm doubting the diagnosis and all this, ran it right. through some, yeah. you know, fancy molecular testing. And sure enough, you know, it did well. And finally they were able to have their surgery not too long ago um, with, with a profound response. So that's so cool to hear actually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's where, that's where data matters now, because now if right. we could study what properties, not what made it necessarily a pancreatic cancer or classified it as, but what are some of the things even potentially that we could recognize as a receptor, as, you know, something yeah. about the profile of this tumor that made it so sensitive to the cancer, right? right? Like it yes. could be that, and, uh, it could be something. I, I feel like uh, this is where we're heading now with AI. We are actually starting to grasp all these mechanisms that could be behind these outcomes. Why is this tumor more sensitive to radiation compared to other tumors, even though we have the same diagnosis for them? I mean, I, I told you, they could be twins, and one of them could respond to treatments, and the other one doesn't. Um, and then there's also the other factor, the one that you, it was so important that you highlighted, the history of the patient. Like all this, the history, I, I don't, because when they patients, let's say most patients, when they arrive to us, we don't know what they have been doing before, and, unless they told us, like, yes, I have been a heavy smoker, yes, I have been drinking a lot of alcohol, let's say, or no, I have never touched a smoke, like a cigarette in my life. So all these variables, we get to know them because the patient tell us that. But maybe in the future, when let's say uh, with one of our friends suggested the deep mind solution, like maybe we have wearables that tell us a lot about the sensor data and other data that collects from our body all the time. That will facilitate our understanding so much of these, like the, the, the variation of data for every patient is so huge that no doctor, no human, kind of grasp all this but computers can do that easily for them it doesn't matter because humans are always uh, like used to think in three dimensions and if you have more than three dimensions then we become super confused but computers can think in billions and trillions of dimensions and all you need is just computational power and hopefully this is also will be solved in the future because computational power the gpus that are being rele released today are so much powerful than two years ago or three years ago so I truly believe that we need, if, if we would like to understand all these variations in biology or about tumors or cancers or even get the chance to have an early diagnosis, uh, we need to have a tool that tell us for certain, considering all these million variables of every patient and then decide like, yes, 90% accuracy, this is pancreatic cancer and not breast cancer, let's say, or this is that abdominal pain, this is abdominal pain connected to pancreatic cancer. Because as maybe you remember from my video, one of the biggest challenges with these cancers is that their symptoms are often vague. You can say that, yeah, maybe I, I'm just getting cold today, or maybe it's the fever, but you don't know if it's connected to cancer or other dangerous diseases because the body, after all, has a limited amount of symptoms it can showcase to the, to, to the outside, right? But at the same time, we have like an infinite amount of diseases that we are exposed to all the time. So how would you be able to distinguish this? And that's why we take like a blood samples, MRI scans, CAT scans, and PET scans, and all these different things just to like boil it down to one specific target, right? Uh, but, but yeah, yeah. So I'm just emphasizing on what you just said. No, that was beautifully explained. And I hope Scott, he's a good friend of mine now at Google, doesn't get offended. I'm like, I think that's the best explanation of how AI can help really understand the questions that everyone's somewhat frustrated with. The lay person, I, yeah. not, I hate to use that term, but the person that's completely non-medical has a right to be frustrated and say like, yeah. yo, you haven't figured this out yet? Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of yeah. money. Like, it's like, what is happening? What's the, what's the word, right? And that's what, it's like the number of potential relevance or irrelevance or patterns is just so large that yeah. it's, you know, you use the word assume before or theory you're like it's just an assumption or theory that radiation works well we have to test it it's the same thing it's like you're at the mercy of the human trying to make some you know pattern recognition of this random protein and to have to then conduct a study to be able to say this is what happens or 
you can actually just query that protein because AI will tell you, yo, we don't know what this is, but this thing that's B79728, for whatever reason, within two or three cycles, all these patients had like pronounced, you know, responses. If you don't believe in AI or if you're just like, nah, I don't know if we need them, you know, for my children or my family or whatever, then that pattern can just be missed. Like you could just, unless right. somebody volitionally one day happens to recognize that and then somehow execute now, you know, a study to where they recruit all this, which takes forever. That's why, that's why so many rare diseases don't have any guidelines. It just takes forever right. to recruit, you know, yeah. uh, people to have a uh, high enough powered study with a reduction in enough of error of probability. So that's, that's the issue. But if you have data, so that's why sharing data is so important. Doesn't mean sharing yeah. your social security number. It's sharing like, are you okay with us seeing what your outcomes are based on two things, the constituents of like your germline or what you're born with, what your circumstances right. are at that moment, like you said, and then also with the cancer. And if they say yes, right, that's what Excures does that powers this podcast, then people that are very interested or have a personal story where something is hurt and they want to get one on cancer, they can query and find out all that stuff using AI far faster than what we could do with human brains. And that is what is so remarkable. What you said just now really hit differently in a way I hadn't heard before. And you were like, if somebody doesn't tell me that they were a smoker or drank alcohol or, you know, had something that was an exposure here, we have a lot of our patients. I had a bladder cancer, you know, recently yeah. that I, there was tumors all in the pelvis. And then when I asked the history, cause there were about 70, 80, they had a ton of, um, chemical exposures and, and inhalational. They were like, Halloween, if it had Ian in it, you know, I was exposed to it. And instantly I was like, this is either bladder or, or, or kidney. But it also said, y'all, let's, ha let's hold on and see what the diagnosis is because now we know those are, you know, pretty responsive to immune therapy and targeted therapy. And they were older. So I didn't want hospice talk knowing that I had something to go on, that they had a lot of exposures. And then, you know, the guidelines recently with bladder have been really encouraging because it's the first time that chemo was replaced. Like general chemo in any person with bladder now has immune therapy and targeted therapy and no other tumor type has just been replaced in a fourth stage, fourth oh, that's stage very interesting. Thing without a contingency. Yeah. It's, it was huge. Okay. But yeah. I love that you said that it's like, we only know what you have told us. And that's why measuring right. these other properties will be really, you know, fascinating. We part in this interruption real quick. If you're enjoying this podcast or find it valuable for what we discuss and the education and how people will see and think about cancer in general, we would very much appreciate a like, subscribe, and especially a share so we can bring that information as maximally and broadly as possible. Thank you so much for listening. I like the idea that you said about the sharing data because that will be the commodity that we will have in the future, right? I mean, oil was very important commodity before and then money and then data will be the new thing, right? Because with data, you can do so much now that actually can either benefit or like to say damage the future of mankind, but hopefully we'll stay on the benefit side. I'm curious about which which side of people do you fall into? Are you the optimistic side about AI or are you, are you the conservative and we should be careful how we use AI? Because right I now there are two groups of people. I think it's ignorant if we like are just like pause AI for even a day. I'm an editorial board member of AI and Precision Oncology. So this is a okay. journal we started. Really, uh, Dr. Doug Flora uh, was, the, was the pioneer for it. And then um, Mary Ann Lieber took it on. So we had our first issue. We have really leaders in AI all over the world. You need to, I definitely need to get you involved where we're just talking about the different implementations and different capacities. Because if anyone yeah. is sitting here in a binary way saying good or bad, yes or no, you don't know what to think about AI. I just need to say yeah. that right now. One of our previous guests was talking about having AI in endoscopy. And when you're oh, doing yeah. these you know, scopes and looking for polyps or really benign polyps, I think the average rate of detection was 66% you know, with human eyes. But now if you could put in Oh, they're 30 years old. Oh, they're Indian. Oh, they are in metformin. Oh, they have a high turmeric and curry diet. All of these things that we know make the polyp nuanced or not look like a standard polyp. And then right. if you're in a community, you know, in Louisiana or Mississippi where it's predominantly white males that are getting scopes, then it's conceivable that if my parents, when they lived in Oklahoma, right, that's where I was born randomly, um, 
that if they're scoping them, they may not see something with their human, at the mercy of the human eyes. So what the endoscopy does, the AI technology it says, oh, based on these metrics, this is actually like 80% suspicious or 90% because his father is an Indian male. And so that is just one example of how AI can basically, yes, it sounds kind of pseudoscience-y like in the matrix, how you just add the knowledge in the brain, but it's not in the brain. Yeah. It's the machine that understands that I've seen thousands and millions of these cases and can help the right. physician who doesn't see thousands and millions of cases recognize something that could be life-saving. Have you used ChatGPT personally? I've really immersed myself in the last couple of weeks, but not enough to uh, speak on did it. it. Did it scare you or did it make you more like, uh, what did you say, optimistic about the future? Because yeah, exactly. I know some people that actually get super scared that ChatGPT is already that good. Really? Yeah. I mean, the way I think about it is when I see my 25 patients a day, I have to go to seven different websites to make sure the dosing hasn't changed for, for kidneys and hepatic. Yeah. Make sure the guideline hasn't changed. See what, like, whatever. All ChatGPT, the way I explain it is rather than me having to do my searches myself, which I've gotten very good at, but take time away from the patient and the family and explaining things to my children because I can't make baseball practice. Right. That is what these AI models are doing, ChatGPT. They get to query these things and basically put it, you know, in front of you pretty, pretty quickly and ultimately make it more efficient. And whatever that site was missing, say that site didn't remember to update the the new dosing for renal function. I don't have to worry about that error because it's also looked at everything else. Right? right. And that's I mean, to me, that's the lens, but but I'd love to, you know, hear what you have to say on it. Yeah, I I feel very optimistic until I realized by working because I, I, I do programs, I do work with AI models, and so do my colleagues because we uh, are like researchers. Um, so I noticed and and I realized that the same models we use to segment tumors in the lungs or use to classify if this is benign or malignant tumor, these models can actually, theoretically speaking, can be used in the battlefield to identify soldiers and identify uh, people, right? So, and I think that's the biggest challenge with AI because people were compar comparing AI to nukes, uh, like, oh yeah, but when nuclear power was a new thing, we have to put regulations, we have to be careful who should use it, who should have access to it. But with AI, this is a totally different game because the, these models are built on code and you can share code in open source platforms. And anyone can download these models and they can use them for the benefit of, of mankind or the other side. That was the part that actually scared me. And that was also the part that's scaring uh, people working deep mind, open AI, that the, the same principles of AI can be used uh, and different things. You can use it to create a new medicine to, or classify different types of cancer, or you can use it to do harm. Uh, but beside that, that's why I, what I love about medicine. Medicine is the only field for AI that it can actually do all the positive things for mankind, right? Like there is no scenario where you can say, oh, this is a bad AI model. This will destroy humanity because we can always use it to like reinvent medicine. We can improve our diagnosis. There are new algorithms that can help us discover and develop our current medicine. And even the prospective studies, it can help us with the ethics, with recruiting patients. It can help us to uh, minimize the gap in the bias of our data analysis. And especially, it's important if you have different races in your, like patients are different races and you work with uh, all these variables that could be, theoretically speaking, used as bias in your data. AI doesn't have to care about that. Um, so I, I'm very optimistic in that sense. And also I love the natural language processing models now that they can help us reduce the work and load in our electronic uh, health record analysis and systems, because that also takes a lot of time from the uh, doctors and nurses because they have to document all that and, and they have to keep tra track of every patient's history, right? When they visit, they have to go into these records and read everything instead of maybe having something that could summarize based on the highlights that are specifically relevant for this case today. Um, so yeah, so based on my work and research, I would say I'm mostly optimistic about AI, but you can it doesn't hurt to be careful, let's say. That's right. So I listened to a fascinating podcast with uh, Guillaume. I'm forgetting his whole name, but he worked for Google, started a company, and, and is a big thought leader in AI. And to your point about the the nuclear weapons his point was 
when you start regulating, but you don't know what the consequences of your regulation are, because you're, it's actually yeah. somewhat, you know, brazen to say, I know the regulation here should be done in, in the Middle East and here, but not here. And then you end up having something like the States, which has the most like nukes ever. And a lot of people are like, why can't we have ours? It's that you are actually, that could be the cause of bias. That if you start introducing regulations in AI somewhat willy nilly within yeah. the unknown or unidentified biases and just incorrect presumptions of the human mind, you could actually now be teaching a model that has a shift that's not necessarily the healthiest thing. So he talks about this concept of, I don't remember if he said a permissive, a cautious but permissive error tolerance or or yeah, yeah. autonomy tolerance, but he's like, you almost don't want to, you know, put your finger in the pond because you don't know the consequences of the ripples for something we don't understand fully. And that was just a very mind blowing concept that you almost want this like natural process because bias is introduced if you think presumptuously by with the human mind that you know what should and shouldn't be yes or no's. Yeah, I mean, we are already using AI right now in our clinic uh, in Lund at Scone University Hospital. So we're using AI in the way that we use segmentation model that could reduce the workload on the doctors. And instead of them uh, delineating the bladder, the femur heads and the pelvis and the heart and other, like the lungs, these AI models are already more than capable to do that by themselves, right? based on a small set of data. So this is already being implemented in my clinic and doctors are very, feeling very happy about it, of course. And now we're using AI to convert MRI images to CAT scan images or CT uh, scan images because that you can use to calculate radiotherapy doses, but you can't do that on MRI images. But with MRI images, you have better uh, like contrast uh, for the normal, like the soft tissues and you can see more information with MRI images and you reduce the registration errors and delineation errors using MRI because you can see more with it. But then you use AI to convert to CT scans to calculate your doses. Uh, so these uses of AI, if you all of a sudden come to the clinic and say, you know what, I know they are good, but let's take them away. And then, but other countries, they keep doing it. They keep developing it. They keep improving their medicine and the, the, the quality of, of life for their patients. How would you justify this, right? just because you are maybe concerned in about 10 years, we will have robots that can be evil. I mean, it, it just, it just, it sounds a bit silly now, but I know that these are the hard questions that most people that go on podcasts talk about, and they work with Google, OpenAI, and even Microsoft. This is the dilemma we have now, because these models can be used for good and can be used for bad. And then we have to be careful how, how to share data that could empower the bad models. Let's say if I have a friend who works in, in biotech and they, they use a lot of deep learning right now to create a new med medicine, basically. But then you can use the same tech to create a new viruses, right? And, and that's like, it's, it's such a, a hard problem now because it's, it's like you have a, a double-edged sword and you, you don't know what to do with it right now. But right. so, yeah, you have to be always aware of how to use your um, AI models and most, more, more importantly, the data. Because if you have important data, you're not allowed maybe to share it. I don't know about the data sharing policy in the US, but in Sweden, you, we barely allow to share data between hospitals. We have to go through a lot of ethical agreements and so on. So it's not like you send a, an email and then it's done. No. Uh, yeah. yeah, same here. But I'm afraid a lot of our, you know, red tape is more for financial reasons. Like it's it's more than the ethics. It's Of course, you have to, the patient has a consent or if it's de-identified. But I think you know, in the capitalistic way of, of our country, they want to make sure that they're not leaving money on the table that they could have retrieved yeah. for the data that, that you have value. In a weird way, well, backing up about the good and evil, philosophically, that really seems like the light of humankind as it is, right? Or any civilization yeah. for that matter, or any species. It's like, how do you take the fact that we identified the first arrowhead or the first nuke or the first bullet and good or evil, right? And that's a huge problem here, gun control and violence. And so, I mean, to me, it's more of the same in that capacity is you just have to either trust human, you know, kind and and, and yeah. that will do right. And you could go very Old Testament with it. And, you know, I mean, there's just so many, you know, bigger philosophical concepts. So with all that said, going back to cancer and especially with what you're doing with physics and radiotherapy, what are one or two of the things that are fascinating to you either 
just how they work or a demonstration of our medical science or you know optimistically for any cancer that you think will really be you know i hate the term game changer but will really change be a paradigm shifter let's use a more adult phrase yeah um that you're excited about i'm very excited when it comes to pancreatic cancer because it's one of the cancers that are so hard to cure right now even though this is 2024 and we thought we have came so far in medicine this is still one of the challenging cancer but also, I'm very excited to see the development in curing glioblastomas. If there is a possibility that we can use maybe AI or a combination of medicines and AI to maybe improve the life quality or at least find a groups of patients that have glioblastoma that we can maybe cure and then maybe improve the quality for the other patients. Is there anything about the tools themselves that you're excited about? Because we did have one podcast with Sonola Sense, and what they're doing is basically pumping you with alanine, which they recognized glioblastomas and some tumor types uh, need a lot of. They want to eat. They need the creatine and protein because they're you know yeah. the muscle men in the gym. And then they take the blue uh, wavelength from an ultrasound to then flip the alanine into protoporphyrin, yeah. which we know is damaging, right? When you have porphyria, you right. get the sun exposure and everything bubbles yeah. and, and hurts your skin. They said, yo, let's do that inside the cell itself. And so they use targeted wavelength um, uh, catalytic yeah. activity to destroy the cell, almost like a Trojan horse, which I thought was just Yeah, insane. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We have the same principle right now. We're working on and learn, like, not the same exact principle, but like the same approach to use the Trojan horse. And hopefully we can activate it using maybe radiation. So now we're trying to do some research that maybe we can inject viruses in, inside the so that can penetrate the brain uh, tissue barrier and then maybe we can activate them with radiation because when you activate them inside their brain they then they have already reached the glioblastoma cancer cells and hopefully that will have higher impact than just injecting them in the blood and then then they wouldn't go through the brain tissue barrier so uh, so what do you have how do you quote unquote activate the virus is it carrying a chemo or or treatment or is it recruiting immune cells yeah, it's recruiting immune cells, you can say. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I don't know the exact details, but the principle was that you kind of create small viruses of it. And then these viruses can be then uh, killed using the radiation, but what they were carrying can be spread in the glioblastoma. So that was the cool thing that, yeah. And now they're trying it uh, in the process of our trying it, um, see if it's feasible to try it on, you know, uh, rats and other biological uh, samples we have. But yeah. it's still under development. So the concept is really cool. But this is one of the tools, right? So because we have maybe uh, some people were talking about nanobots before, and that was could, could that could be a thing. But then it all of a sudden became very silent about nanobots. I don't know how the progress is looking right now. But uh, I, I think when it comes to radiotherapy, the, the game changing thing will be the hypofractionation when you go to higher doses but then lower fractions. So that's something that I'm very excited about because we still see some studies, especially in prostate cancer, where you can maybe treat the patients using three fractions instead of seven, and before it was 25, and before that was 35, and so on. So there are all these new studies that confirm that hypofractionation is working. So this is something I'm very excited about to see how it, how far can we go? Can we go? Can of do it in one and, and see if it's feasible? Uh, when it comes to the other cancers, uh, it, I'm, I'm still, like, I feel like I will be excited about all the different developments in cancers because they're all kind of the same for me. But glioblastoma and pancreatic cancers are the cancers that it kind of make you, it makes my heart beat a bit extra when I hear that there is some progress in them because it's, it's, they are well known to be the yeah most advanced cancer cases and the, the trickiest, you could say. And in most of these patients, like at least the glioblastoma, some like some of our patients have been kids, and it it just kind of leave a different impact on you. Yeah, one hundred percent. And you know, anyone listening, some of the viruses we think about for CNS or central nervous system penetration, you know, syphilis is a big one down in Louisiana. So you can have, you know, we have secondary tertiary syphilis. We have one with that that we know affects the brain and you have to have a high degree yeah. of suspicion to really think about that west nile virus is another example so i mean many viruses go into yeah. quote unquote th or through the blood brain barrier which we know inherently is designed to protect the most important organ and yeah. so if you believe in evolution 
you know, it, it has all these things that say, yo, anything toxic, anything you might've eaten that was sketchy and you didn't know it was sketchy. We don't want that, you know, messing us up in the, in the, in the place where you get your respiratory drive and, and, and your primal instinct and, and really the cognition to even go on with another day of life. And that has been one of the challenges for glioblastoma and other, uh, things that metastasize to the central nervous system. So speaking on GBM, um, can you explain a little bit to your best ability what is gamma knife and how come gamma knife requires both a neurosurgeon and a radiation doctor and who's doing the surgery and if there's not a scalpel why is a neurosurgeon in there how does that work um, yeah. and and why and what makes it so precise when it comes to how you're able to carve through i assume the bleed is not as much you know collaterally kind yeah. of the way we theorize about proton therapy and why aren't we using gamma knife anywhere else I have to be honest here that we don't have gamma knife in Lund. We use a different type of radio sur surgery. We we use uh, stereostactic body radio surgery uh, instead. Uh, but the gamma knife is something like well known to have this kind of sub millimeter accuracy, and it, it's true. the reason why you're required to have a real surgeon there because the consequences can be honestly just as bad as a surgeon cutting the wrong part of the brain, right? Because you have you can think about it as the patient enters as a machine that looks like a donut. And then there is a focal point, the ISO center, where all these beam, laser beams can be focused on that specific point. And you can think about it as if like the sun concentrates all its power in that specific 0 0.5 millimeter point. So if you happen to aim that point a bit wrong, then you, this tissue, are, are, there is game over for that tissue, right? But if it's a tumor, that's good news because we can uh, target these tumors in very high accuracy. But for you to make sure that this is happening in a uh, high accuracy and exactly as the doctor prescribed, it's very common that we have uh, a surgeon in the room. I don't know how about they do it in Stockholm because there they have cyber knife, but I'm sure they do it also like the same way. There's always a doctor present and it's not only the nurses. There's a nurses, medical physicist, and a doctor. And that's kind of the standard uh, treatment workflow actually, even in Lund, if you have a uh, stereotactic bed rate surgery. Um, so, and, and that's the consequence, right? Because you're delivering a lot of uh, radiation to a very small sphere in, in the brain, oftenly. But it can also be in the lung or other regions. But the cyber nap is mostly used for the brain, what I know. The way I visualize it is how you can, you know, buy like a case or something that's metal and then you're engraving it. And they, they have the YouTube videos where you're seeing yeah. high power things sketch out the entire name. I mean, that's what you're doing. Uh, to that intensity, but obviously, if you just slip, it could be a very big problem. Second part being the reason we do, do don't do gamma knife for the same reason, you know, when it comes to radiation in the body, is you intentionally want to deliver radiation to what we call micrometastatic disease. Micrometastatic meaning you're not able to visualize the tumor, but you know it's there because otherwise the cure rate would be 100%. So you know there's some stuff hanging around that is not visualizable. Um, right. And then when you deliver this radiation uh, somewhat intentionally to the area surrounding, then your hope is you're taking care of a very small army of, of cells that just can't really win the battle on their own because they're not big enough to be a mass and have all these yeah. kind of you know properties to be able to to avoid the immune system and survive. And, and that's also getting better thanks to the advancement in med in imaging, right? Because now they ha we have. Uh, the, the quality of our images, x-rays or MRIs or any other images, are so much better than five years ago. And now we are adding, on top of that, we're adding AI to minimize the acquisition time of the image. So images before took 30 to one minute, like 30 seconds to one minute. Now they're taking seven seconds up to like 20 seconds. But then you still have the same quality or even sometimes better because the AI knows how to filter the noise, knows how the geometry of the patients, like how, how like, the physiology of the human body looks like. So it doesn't like remove that when it corrects for the noise and other uh, outliers in the image. So thanks to this uh, imaging advancements, we can now take more than one image to always make sure that the patient position correctly, or maybe take images during treatment and predict if the patient will move uh, based on like the history of the movement, let's say. So right now we're treating a, a prostate cancer using uh, uh, like a, a machine that kind of act like the cyber knife, right? It's because it has a very focused laser. Uh, I, I call it laser, but it's, you can think about it as a laser, but it's like a, a focused beam of, radio, of radiation. And then it's tracking the movement of the prostate because inside the prostate, it's very 
uh, common for us that we use golden fiducials to always be sure that the prostate is there when we take x-ray images. So now this machine can track the movement of the prostate and it can also compare this movement with the history of, of the movements before to always predict how the future movement will be. That no human can do that. All the machines can do that, right? Because humans can uh, save all this data in their head and then maybe predict. And then they can't analyze, let's say, hundreds of patients and know that this trajectory is looking kind of identical to another patient a year ago. And then it probably will be like this today because that patient did this movement today too. And, you know, it's all these cool things that we have today that will facilitate treating patients that we considered maybe either too hard to treat before or we couldn't treat them because of the side effects that they had before, especially, let's say, for rectal cancer patients and so on. Now we have online adaptive treatments, and hopefully that will help us minimize the margins, the radiation, based on how the patient looks today and not a week ago, because that's what most centers do, right? It's, it's too hard to always replan the treatment dose every day. But now with AI and all these tools we have and the image quality, you can do it on the couch while the patient is there. And the treatment could take up to one hour, but that's fine. If, if your goal and intention is to offer the best treatment possible for that patient, then you succeeded at least. Like this is, in, in most cases, this is like the common sense. You have to adapt your margins based on today and not a week ago, right? Right. And that's what, I mean, that's a great example of one tiny minimal example. They've studied athletes so much to figure out why Michael Phelps is such a good swimmer, right? Like the ratio of his fingers to arms to... It's just, that's just one example of why at the beginning of this episode, when we were talking about every case is different, every person is different, every biologist is different. Now here's another entire basket of different. When you're reading the stuff in the, in the past, you don't know that that person, what, you know, did their machines adapt, adaptive, you know, delivery based on with now AI understanding, or are they just adapting based on what they found in the last four minutes? And that's if yeah. they're adapting because a lot of the radiotherapy and machines don't aren't doing that at all and still don't in this country. So anyone listening, I'm hoping they can appreciate why the percentages of success and not success and complication are all over the place. Does your yeah. machine adapt or not? And does it use AI and match it with somebody, you know, in the past or is it with, you know, with someone else or not? So these are a lot of the variables that are just so challenging to put into one hour podcast or even a book because I've been trying to do that for years now and I'm still, it's just so much. But yeah, um, and it's, it's going so rapidly too. So it's so hard to keep up. And, and choose what's relevant now. And you have to guess, will it be relevant when I re release the book? Because it's changing all the time. Exactly. Yeah. That's what happens yeah. too. I have to keep writing. I'm like, whoa, the way I worded that is technically incorrect because X, Y, Z. <laughs> and so, you know, to your point about, you know, better imaging, can you tell me, because I've heard different answers and I just yeah. did the math and, and, and have a number myself, but on an average CAT scan <laughs> versus an average MRI, how is many... It? cells are required to be clumped together to visualize it on an average CAT scan or MRI. What we've done is like measured like how much an average cell is, like say a breast cancer cell, yeah. right? The size. And then you know yeah. you need about three millimeters on like a, a CAT scan or four if your CAT yeah. scan is really good. And we just did the math, like cubic math and says, okay, it needs okay. to be yeah. hundred million ish is usually yeah. the number I would use. Because that's how, how I would do it in case I, I like it was my task to solve this problem. But but also you have to now we have MRI scans that can go up to 10 Teslas. And before we were used to like 1.5. And now we have um, MR LENAC, when you have an MRI machine connected to a LENAC machine, where you can like treat the patient the same time you have an MRI image, like taken, I think, 20 times a second. So it's like, we call it uh, live because it's uh -huh. like so fast. Uh, so with this accuracy, you can treat a lot of tumors now that work, like for specifically pancreatic cancer. That's something we love to treat with MRI Linux. And uh, I've been at a conference uh, two weeks ago where Denmark had a case of pancreatic cancer and they tried to treat it with a different machine. And yeah, it went well, but it took, it, it took a lot of uh, stress to, to get that level of accuracy compared to you have it in MRI Linux where you can like have an MRI machine with a high contrast, with nice visualization of the soft tissues because the pancreas is well hidden in the abdomen. But then you can still deliver very high accuracy treatments because of the imaging quality we have. Yeah. And now, you know, we've had a few episodes, I think it was more Sanola sense, but people suggesting that just understanding what the meal 
looks like for a cancer, kind of to that same principle of whey protein yeah. and creatine for the person that's you know putting on muscle mass. When you can characterize that, you can now infuse or or put in things through the blood that they you know the cancer is going to consume. And of course, different cancers consume different things. But if you can isolate that amino acid or yeah. that ketone or or not the ketone in a lot of examples, yeah. there are a lot of cases. Whatever that is, you kind of tag it, much like a PET scan, where you're kind of tagging the glucose uh, yeah. consumption in that very same principle, but to a higher quote unquote sensitivity, meaning you don't need as much consumption as you need for you know glucose and activity on a PET scan for yeah. something else that may localize a, pan a pancreatic cancer, which we know has a high you know KI sixty seven, so the replication rate. Those are the things that are just hungry, they like to grow. Right, things that are very hot. You can imagine. If it needs to be hydrated and you can tag it somehow, then you can visualize these things sooner. Yeah, I, I, let me tell you another cool example about uh, how we're using AI now to study the pixels. Because, I mean, for the human eye, a pixel is nothing, right? I mean, but for, for machine learning and AI and deep learning models, these pixels are all packed with information and they can study it to correlate. So one of my colleagues now is checking uh, uh, if, if there is a way we can predict the symptoms or like the side effects, sorry, of head and neck cancer patients. One of them is xerostomia where you have dryness of mouth. So that was one of them that like you can study these CT scans of the patients and you can also see their treatment plan and then you can put them inside an AI model and it will tell you the probability or that this patient will have xerostomia or which patients will get xerostomia and which patients won't. Oh, wow. And that's purely based on pixels. I mean, this is just pixels. This is pixel wow. information. And now one, uh, my co-supervisor, like PhD supervisor, he is studying even combining the RNA sequencing of these tumors and the head and neck cancer patients. We're trying to combine these informations with the pixel information from images just to see if it's possible to see why certain patients, like immune therapy doesn't work for certain head and neck cancer patients, and why certain patients respond really well for immunotherapy. So even though we consider the image quality is getting better, and we're happy that we see the tumors and so on, but this, you can also think about that the pixel quality of your data is getting so much better that we can use it in AI and other statistical models. That is absolutely wild. It blew my mind yeah. for our AI and prisoner oncology webinar, where Nikhil, Dr. Nikhil Takakar, he's a, a radiation oncologist. He was at MD Anderson at the time. He told me with their imaging modalities, there is nothing more frustrating as a medical oncologist than having a stage four lung cancer with high volume, right? So like their, their you know, time yeah, is limited. Yeah. And the amount of time and technical headache to get molecular testing, which by the way, still isn't even done on 15% of minorities, Latinos and African-Americans in this country still because it offers you a targeted therapy, right? That you can forego yeah. chemo and have great responses that are prolonged. It still takes three or four weeks. And he told me on the imaging that with, because of AI, we've learned that you can tell when a cancer in the lung is EGFR positive, which is one of the best targeted oral therapies you can have, 85% yeah. you know, <laughs> success rate uh, or sensitivity just with the image. So instead of now having to you know, request the specimen sample, send it to the lab, do the molecular testing for two to three weeks, right? You know, PCR, whatever they do, have it back. I can at least with high probability have it. Now it's a different issue to then get it approved, you know, through the yeah. government to say, hey, yeah. you know, it's 99% accurate. And they're like, you, but it's AI and we don't know. We still are yeah. like the tissue stuff. But it can help patients because the longer someone has high volume disease, the more I keep teaching this to my staff, like in my clinic, I'm like, it's not necessarily a big problem now, but it's, but it's how much of a problem we have later because these colonies right. that are getting smarter, not smarter, Siddhartha Mukherjee and Michael Levin, well, Siddhartha Mukherjee is like, they don't have brains someday, they don't get smart. But the ones that <laughs> statistically have escape mechanisms just and the chance of randomness, the more volume yeah. you have, the more potential you have for something to be not sensitive to EGFR therapy. So you want to cite or reduce as soon as possible. And yeah. you know, being obsessed with these things are what can make the difference of months or potentially years you know, if we're sensitive and and aware of them. And I think that's what AI will help with too. Like, yo, we can't yeah. just like say, oh, it is what it is. It'll be three or four weeks and they have, you know, 20 spots. Like we can say the outcome, survival outcomes do this, you know, later down the line uh, and start to split because of the reduction and the, pr 
promptness and time to reduction to reduce the mutational variability of things that will present as a problem down the line. Yeah. Uh, there's also another field of AI that's concerned only with the uncertainty of AI models. So when they say, oh yeah, this uh, this patient is, th this is the tumor of this patient. How certain can you be that this uh, model is correct? I mean, you could, you could all of a sudden have a, an AI model that guesses the shape of the tumor, right? So you always have to make sure that your AI models are working according to your guidelines. And so this is one of the fields that one of my colleagues is working on. It's called the uncertainty in estimations of segmentations and classifications. You can always look where the AI is looking to make that decision making happen, right? And so, for example, if you would like to segment a tumor in the brain and the AI model is all of a sudden looking at the patient's elbows, you know that this is this is was just purely guessed how it segmented the glioblastoma tumor in the brain. But if it was actually looking at the tumor, then you know for certain that the model is learning. It's, it's it, all these important features that make this tumor a tumor. And the same thing is when we would like to predict xerostomia. We always had the theories and some research publications that the parotid glands are the most important ones to uh, reserve when, it's, when you do your treatment plannings. But then when you have an AI model that actually can predict with 90% accuracy if patients will have a dryness of mouth, like xerostomia or not, and they look at the parotid glands to make that decision, that's a totally different game all of a sudden, right? Because now it's not only subjective to data noise and statistics, this is like you have trained a human for many, many years to come up with the best approach possible, and they purely base that approach on this kind of biological features or biomarkers. So now we and know more thanks to this kind of visualization, so a certainty. That's insane. And anyone yeah. listening like, oh man, this is why AI is tough because you got to have AI to make sure that the AI is even like, you know, standardized or correct. Just so y'all know, we do that all the time, right? Like our labs, even our chemistries and CDC, we have to recalibrate. And sometimes I'll tell my, my lab, I'm like, hey, when was the last recalibration? Why is every sodium, you know, four points lower on my first four patients? Like this is something you have to be aware of. Nobody can just say I'm going to do molecular testing or, or tissue testing and and not have a standardization to make sure the sensitivity is correct and the accuracy is correct. It's kind of a big problem that happened with 23andMe and all this polymorphism uh, stuff when it comes to SNPs. People are like, I have a increased relative of risk of 10,000 cancers at 10,000 different ways. That polymorphism is not necessarily yeah. epigenetically and phenotypically relevant. And now it caused, you know, for a while, a lot of chaos, including myself. When I saw it, I literally like took out an extra life policy for my kids. I was like, this is like, I'm just, I'm, I'm not making it, you know? And then I had to really dig into that. We had Dina, uh, uh, with Dina DNA do a podcast like, yo, this is why you don't necessarily freak out. But this is a concept when it comes to any level of tech or machinery is there yeah. needs to be a cali cali calibration, a standardization. And anyone like my dad, who's listening who's an engineer and does Six Sigma quality improvement, he goes, well, yes, Sanjay, why are you having to say that? It's like, because medical people don't <laughs> think like that. Like, you know, like that, that, that's a whole different thing. And, you know, I think we, I think if nothing else, we've uncovered several things that are several pieces of the puzzle. And it goes from even the quality of what you're imaging to how you're delivering the therapy to what is the, the, you know, unique calibration to the individual as well as the equipment itself and how AI can yeah. just be at a whole nother level of, fail safe, if nothing else, a fail safe to not permit possibly the variability of error in eyeballs and a brain of someone that has five yeah. years experience versus 15 versus 20, but also what the demographic of their patients over their career is. Like, again, if it's predominantly Caucasian, if it's predominantly, uh, you know, Latin American, their, even their brain, even though they have a lot of volume, doesn't take into account the variations for someone of a different ethnicity. And and this yeah. is why it's so complex. And then go downstream to the tumor. Because those tumors yeah. still have the same germline proper properties, many of them that your inherent cells do that matter on where your parents were born. So it's like, this hopefully starts to explain why these statistic ranges every day, like today when I have patients and I'll say we have about a 40 to 60% chance of working or 70% of these almost seemingly terrible statistics is because of all that variability. But I would love, if nothing else, to have a better percentage, you know, level outcome to not discourage patients prematurely, or at least yeah. it'd be more relevant to them. And the way we do that is data and being able to appreciate their own biology, 
their tumor's biology, and then therefore, if nothing else, do right by the patient and their families to have a more accurate idea of outcome and response rather than this very shotgun, you know, antiquated, barbaric way of just large sample size data, put it all together, don't really sort it out nearly the way we should, you know, and and I hope someone can appreciate that listening to this. Yeah, I remember some people were frustrated that we fund we we funded and we found uh, a vaccine for covid very quickly but we still haven't managed to find a way like a vaccine for cancer and i think this is i mean i hope they understand now if they're listening to this podcast that the, the mission here is so much harder than a vaccine for covid absolutely well musty this has been a humongous pleasure i really hope Thank you. that we continue our journey together in some way collaboratively uh, to help one you know, help it be understood and to kind of educate and help and empower patients to know where they need to go, what their quality of care is, et cetera. So yeah. Yeah. I just thank you so much. And I'm a big fan. Thank you so much. Yeah. And we'll, yeah, uh, no, big fan too. So I love this and it feels so mutual. And thank you so much for having me here. It means a lot to me. Of course.